So where were you, Chris? Um, <laughs> for me, I think the issue is really um, nurturing the genre, which is something that we consider really important. And, and in some ways, I think the idea of quantity of games is almost a, is, is too simple a thing. I think it's the quality of the games, what you do with it, and how much you choose to innovate. Um, you know, I think the way that with our sort of what we call our platform strategy and the number of songs we're able to get into the games and with Rockman Network to get even more, like just creating a really cool experience for, for people. Um, like I don't think there's like a mythical number on Like we, we're still pretty cautious on how many games we do. Like, like Green Day was a really, honestly turned into a really cool opportunity for us to like, to like present an artist with a really cool dynamic on stage performance and get that into the world, get their music in there in a certain way. Um, but I think overall, the goal is just to, I don't know, be thoughtful about it, like be careful with it. Yeah, I think, I mean, what do you guys think? As long as we keep making games that like we're super passionate about and put care into, are you guys gonna buy them? <laughs> so like, whatever the economy is, as long as we're like putting out stuff that we love, we think you guys will love it, keep our jobs. <laughs> I have a long-winded three-part answer to this, actually. Uh, which one can make company killing? Uh, one thing is like the like like we mentioned before, like we like there's this this big beef in like the media of like you know never soft and harmonics hate each other and want to stab each other. And it's, it's not the case. Like we think those guys are doing you know a great job on the stuff they're doing and they're you know putting loads of pressure on us and they're they're great people. So like I. I've said this a couple of times before, but like we don't have a beef with people like that. We just want the music genre to, fr to thrive and be like a really awesome thing. I think as well as like the thing that uh, the thing that Casey touched on is that I mean a lot of the sort of economic stuff we get back is talking about gross sales, and we have a huge install base now, which we didn't have five years ago. So like a lot of this like sort of reports you see of people saying, "Oh, music genre is tanking," isn't really an apples to apples comparison because. You know, we're selling more discs and bundles, and we're you know we're, we're relatively surviving because of that. And like in terms of the music genre in general, general, I mean, rhythm action has been around for four years now. I mean, it's it's not a new thing anymore. But uh, at the same time, like FPSs have existed, and at the same time, we're an innovative company, and we've made awesome games before rock band, we we'll make awesome games after rock band. Like we, we, I, I wouldn't be here if we weren't make if we were go weren't going to make innovative games. Thank you guys so much for the answers. Thanks. Thanks. So we have uh, yeah, 15 minutes left. Uh, so if we can do like a lightning round, that'd be awesome. Sweet. Um, we've heard details about Green Day with the pre order deal, so you can do that. That's great. Um, is that? And we've heard the details for the US. Is that going to be the same globally? Um, I actually don't know. Um, but we're um, for what it's worth, we're really psyched that we're able to do that. The the export fee. Uh, it's something that's just sort of necessary from a licensing perspective. We're really glad that GameStop was able to help us with that. And for people who already haven't bought the um, the current Green Day DLC, the Plus Edition gives you both the uh, export token for free and the token for those songs. So that's a, actually a really good value for seven dollars. Sorry, I don't know anything about the international. Okay. Hi. Uh, I don't know if this breaks any of the rules, but that we probably <laughs> Um, are you guys trying to recapture the um, the original set list from from the original Guitar Hero? Because you, you've been releasing some DLC that that has been uh, that was on the first the first uh, the game that you worked on. So have you been trying to, uh, to get these songs back into a game that you're working on, or is that just a happy coincidence? This is actually kind of funny because like the other thing I keep hearing along these lines, like, uh, are you guys paying radio stations to play songs of rock band? Because I always get rock bands on the radio. I mean, I think the thing is we have like about 1,200 ish songs on the, on the store now, and there's, I mean, naturally, they're awesome songs. Like, there's going to be overlap across, I mean, not just guitar here, but like every other music game on the market. I think it's, as long as the only criteria for us picking songs is that it's an awesome song. Thanks. Um, <coughs> uh, a couple of questions. Um, really quick things. First of all, thank you guys for doing this. It's really cool. Um, I think Drum trainer and the, the tracks that you laid out really helped me get better. Part of just 
getting to those off-time kicks and stuff. Have you ever given any thought to moving from like, the entertainment to the educational market and trying to use what you've created to, to really help people learn these instruments, um, and not just in a plastic version of the music? I think like the drum trainer actually does a really good job at teaching people like limb independence and teaching people like the, the basics of drumming, but like uh, in general, we're like more about having fun than teaching people like a real skill and about connecting people to music that like don't know how to play stuff. So, I mean, I don't think we're ever gonna like, I don't know about future products, but you know, we just want people to have fun. Yeah, I think it's, it's actually, we've, we've, you know, we've discussed it and debated it and I think Really, the priority for us is is game, and when you can learn along the way, it's it's really satisfying. Like Dan, I think you learned drums from the yeah, I'm from RB1. I basically learned while we're making RB1. I we have a practice space uh, underneath harmonics. I sort of remember gem track stuff, set up the kit in like the four pad layout, and like learn uh, <laughs> like the rock band my set list just by by going from that. I mean, it sounded terrible, but it was <laughs> it, it was basic skills. We we have had music programs come into the office though and talk about how they're using our products and. We've had some discussions there, and we've had actually had people like volunteer their time to, to try to help out. So there, there is some connection there with, with us and those people. Uh, it's mostly on their end, though. They're using our products to, to help, and yeah. you know we're always interested in hearing that because that's cool. Thank you. That's fine. So uh, do you guys have any specific videos you want to show before we um, run out of time? I don't know what's in the floor. <laughs> Research. Um, we have a bunch of stuff. We have acapella. We have, uh, Actually, so then, did you want to show that PSP thing? Because I think that's like good dirty design. Uh, are you guys interested in like what we do for design sometimes? Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, sure. I worked on a project called Rock Band Unplugged. It was on PSP, and um, that was the first pedal I worked on that was external. Uh, and a lot of our, our jobs are like we write up specs. Um, we talk with everybody in the company about how the game's going, and, and a lot of our jobs are like really nitty gritty stuff. So you can you can see here, this is an earlier version. This game uh, was developed with uh, Foundation 9. Um, Backbone and, Entertainment. And yeah, great awesome. guys. Uh, those guys are really cool. And this this is a, an earlier form of this running on PC. And at this point in the game, you know, I was just like, part of my time was Beatles, part of my time was this. And I was like focusing on it. I was like, something about it just doesn't feel right. When you switch tracks, there's like this feeling where it's maybe like a quarter of a second you can't recover. It feels like, uh, not like the game's style we're going for, when you switch track and start beat matching on the gems right away. Uh, one of the things I did here was I uh, recorded a video just to see what was going on when I switched tracks. And um, When you look at this, you can see that uh, in slow-mo, what we call that, that thing up there where the gems go over, um, we call that uh, the now bar, which has a bunch of smashers in it. Um, you can see that it's not staying in the screen, it's actually attached to the tracks that are next to it. Um, so there's actually a, a period, like a quarter of a second, where it actually disappears. You can see it right here. Um, and it's not on screen. And then it pops into existence there. And uh, that was really problematic. And it was kind of hard to describe in, you know, in, in just general terms why we were feeling like, oh, it's just, it's not as tight as it could be. But, uh, so I showed this to the guys down there um, when they came up to visit us, and it became immediately obvious that this is one of the problems at that point. So uh, I think one of the guys, the lead programmer, said that there's this, actually this study out there where your brain, when you see an image um, of a face, and then you flash uh, a black screen, and then you show it again, people have a hard time remembering if that's the same face. And that could be the same kind of brain thing that's going on here. So once they fixed this, it became like immediately a lot tighter. And a lot of our job is like, uh, macro, but a lot of our job is micro, like in dissecting something, why it's not working. Uh, that's just one example right there. And, and with these games, uh, the core interaction is incredibly simple. I mean, all we're really doing is turning audio on and off in response to whether you hit the button. So all of this visual feedback is incredibly essential for you feeling like you're actually participating in the experience. Like I remember on um, Beatles, like the, the, the height at which the particles that fly off when you hit a gem, like if it wasn't high enough, you didn't notice and you didn't feel like you were playing. And if we made it a little bit higher, suddenly you felt like you were connected to the music. And all that minutia is just essential to us in terms of how to, you know, get that experience across. To <laughs> oh yeah, they, these are some of the more macro level stuff. Like that last one was like the initial ideas for how we could display vocal harmony results, which you can see was different than what we ended up shipping with. We tried different things because people wanted to know what they're doing for every bar and what they're doing for every arrow. So we.